This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. It seems like everyone is sick right now, whether it's a cold, the flu, COVID-19, or none of the above. We'll be getting into all of that and more this hour with Connecticut Department of Public Health Commissioner Manisha Jutani. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for joining Where We Live today. Thanks so much for having me here. And for our listeners, let us know if you have any questions. Give us a call, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So, Commissioner, we're getting through the peak of the flu season now. Hopefully, it's the peak of the flu season. Uh, Before we get to COVID-19, can you give us an idea what's the latest on flu numbers as well as RSV? Absolutely. So what we've seen this year is that flu certainly took off like it normally would in the fall. Usually our flu season runs from about October 1st till May 31st. That's what we usually look at in terms of flu season. And our numbers certainly went up and peaked out really in January post-holidays as we normally expect. And they've been pretty consistently coming down since then. That doesn't mean that flu isn't still around. And as you said, you still hear of people getting sick. Sometimes people hear that numbers are coming down, and so they think they're out of the woods. But we still have seen a fair number of cases through this period of time this season. And what about COVID? You know, how are we continually to monitor the virus without the prevalent testing that we had before? You know, are we still checking wastewater sewages for for that? You know, what, what does that look like today? So for COVID, it is a reportable disease to the Department of Public Health, just like RSV and flu are as well. And so we learn about hospitalizations, about deaths. We don't learn about every single case like we were learning at the beginning of the pandemic for every single test. As everybody knows, self-tests are available. So there are lots of ways that there may be plenty of COVID out there and people may not be testing also for every case of cold-like symptoms that they may have. But even with that, what we've seen is far more COVID in our community than even flu and RSV through this respiratory viral system uh, season, through this entire season. And we have seen somewhere between seven to 10 times more deaths from COVID this season than from flu. And so I think as much as the pandemic is behind us in terms of needing pandemic level precautions, we do know that this virus still is having continual impact in our community and is having its greatest impact on our older adults. So particularly for people 50 and older, that's where we're seeing the more morbidity and mortality coming from COVID itself. And and, as we continue to follow that process, because we are also doing wastewater surveillance to see if that if the virus is spreading in certain communities. So is that something that Connecticut is doing? Is that something that, you know, that's happening right now? So the surveillance of wastewater was primarily run by the CDC through contracts initially in the beginning phases. And of course, we had academic partners like Yale and others who were doing some wastewater testing. Since that time period, we have transitioned to be able to do more and more of this in-house ourselves at the Connecticut State Public Health Lab. And we are in transitionary phases in different areas and in different testing levels. So we don't have quite the same data we did at the beginning of the pandemic, but we continue to be able to explore wastewater testing and do have some data from there. What we can say overall is the trends are all consistent, that All the viruses at this point in time seem to be going down. Now, I mentioned that May is the end of our typical respiratory viral disease season. And why do I say that? Because sometimes later in the spring, in the early spring, we do tend to sometimes get a rise in flu cases again. So flu A can sometimes predominate the beginning with then a subsequent bump in flu B cases. We've not seen that per se just yet, so only time will tell. The other thing we know about COVID is that we are still, I believe, not completely in a place that we know what a natural cadence in terms of a yearly cadence of this virus is going to be for us. So over the last several years, we saw the Delta wave in the late fall. We saw 
late spring waves, and then a higher level of summer prevalence than we do for any other respiratory viral disease. What I would love to see this season, I cannot predict that that'll be the case, is that COVID is going down and will continue to go down and bottom out the way we see other respiratory viral diseases happen in June, July, and August, and then start to rise in the fall again. But I don't know if we're there yet and if that will actually happen for this virus. Well, and I think with what you just said, too, can you talk about, you know, where are we on vaccination? You know, is that making an impact? Is that is that sort of part of why we're seeing lower numbers? You know, who should be getting what and when? So we are nowhere close to where we were at this the beginning of this pandemic or even a couple of years ago. Every year we have gotten better. And why do I say that? I mean, we have natural immunity from people that have gotten COVID. We have immunity from vaccination, the initial, the subsequent boosters, and now what has become a yearly cadence recommendation for COVID vaccines. And right now, the recommendation is the same for flu vaccines and COVID vaccines, which is that if you are six months and older, you are eligible to get both a COVID shot and a flu shot on a yearly basis. We'll see if that changes at all in terms of CDC recommendations going into this coming season, meaning this coming fall of 24. But what I would say is most important is that, as I said earlier, the burden of this virus is most in our older adults. And so certainly for people 50 and older, I strongly recommend getting that yearly flu shot, COVID shot. And I think that we've seen the burden, as I said, of COVID-related mortality and deaths be far higher in every decade increase in life that we see. And because when we spoke last time, there was a huge amount of people trying to get the latest vaccination. Are you still seeing people get, having a hard time getting appointments? Is that process smoother now that we're more familiar with? You know, what are you seeing? I think that backlog was in the first couple of weeks. And after that, we've had plenty availability of both vaccinations and appointments. And what we see is that people really did get most vaccinated in October. That is usually our peak month for both flu and COVID vaccinations. People have continued getting vaccines, which I appreciate that people are trying to protect themselves and their families, but it's certainly come way down uh, over our peak that was in October. And so we've still had people getting vaccines every week. Uh, we definitely have thousands of people who still do on a weekly basis, but right. nowhere close to our peak. Right. And I, you know, I think as we're as we're sort of familiarizing our, ourselves with this process you know, and there's moments where, you know, people I think are still struggling with this. And do you think maybe it's this mindset how, you know, it's been a couple of years, um, we're kind of in this foggy space um, that has led the CDC perhaps to wanting to sort of loosen up some of those guidances and, and there's a possibility of dropping the isolation um, guidance on COVID. COVID. And for our listeners, just so you know that right now the state um, website does defer to uh, CDC guidance. So what are your thoughts about that in terms of in terms of them potentially dropping that isolation? One of the things we reiterated at the beginning of this respiratory viral season, and particularly for our schools, because I do think it's so important for healthy kids to be in school as much as possible, is that respiratory viruses are contagious when you have symptoms. There's no doubt about that. So if you have a fever, you're actively coughing, your kid is sick, you are sick, you should not be going into the workplace at those periods of time. So no matter what the CDC ends up saying, there's in terms of their COVID-specific guidance, I am confident they are never going to change the idea that if you are actively sick, you should stay home, whether you're a child, whether you're going into a workplace. So that is not going to change. And that is consistent with what they've always said on respiratory viral diseases. And that is what we have reinforced as well, which is that if you have these types of symptoms, whether you know what you have or you don't at that period of time, you should be staying home. Now, your specific question on COVID, we are waiting to see what the CDC says. If you know you have COVID, what you should do. And the first thing I would say, particularly if you're older, is you should seek treatment. Because I think 
the chances of benefiting from treatment are highest in our older adults in terms of preventing morbidity and mortality from COVID. For younger people, less so. That's, you know, unless you're immunocompromised or have other existing conditions. And so we'll wait and see what the CDC says specifically on that issue of five days of isolation. But what I think is the biggest point to drive home is, again, if you have symptoms, you should stay away from other people. And also just to to clarify for our listeners, you know, we're talking about this potential change, which was reported by the Washington Post, um, who cited unnamed CDC sources. And uh, so if the change happens, it would mean that the current recommendation of five days of isolation would be eliminated if you were tested positive for COVID. And so in, instead, people would go by uh, symptoms. I have a sneaky suspicion. I know what you're going to say here, Commissioner, but public health experts have denounced this potential move. So do you have concerns if this if this guideline was was dropped? I think we have to go based on the body of evidence we have over now going into four years of experience with this pandemic. There is literature to support what is going to be both a practical consideration and one that protects the public and its health more broadly. What we know is that there are lots of things that we are at risk of every day. If you go into a car, you are at risk for getting into a car accident. If you walk across the street, you are at risk. There is always going to be risks from things. And so we really have to balance what the risks of the virus are at this point in time versus what the benefits are. And so that's where I think the CDC will take into account all of those things when they make a final recommendation. Well, then you're talking about risks. So, you know, walking down the street, going to a grocery store, going to a crowded space. So given that so many of us are sick right now or having the sniffles, would you recommend that we should still be wearing a mask if we're going into a crowded space or a public space? You know, what are your thoughts on that? I do think that's really a personal choice in the sense that if you were going into a crowded space and certainly you've had any risk factors, it certainly makes sense to wear a mask. If you don't have specific risk factors that put you at greater risk from a health perspective, I really do think it's a personal choice on what your comfort level is. If you are going into a pers- into a public space and you are sick, you really should not be going. That That's right. just not really the right thing to be doing at that point in time. And if you have sniffles, it is certainly... a a nice thing to do to wear a mask in front of other people. But at this point, I don't think that there are specific consistent recommendations that I would say everybody should be doing this. That's not where we are in this pandemic. That's not where I think the best public health guidance is, to be frank. I think the best public health guidance is more for the people who are sick at this point in time to make sure they stay away from others, to prevent others from getting sick. Well, and I want to talk about long COVID here. We have a couple questions here from our own social media editor, Janae Spinato here at Connecticut Public. Um, So nearly one in four adults who contracted COVID-19 developed long COVID symptoms. And that's according to the most recent data that came out from the Census Bureau. So Commissioner, are there any campaigns or active efforts to educate Connecticut providers in terms of looking for signs of long COVID? One of the things that's very interesting that has come out most recently, and as you mentioned, some of the data that has been coming out from survey type data that occurs through the CDC, is that there are a lot of people, as you mentioned, who experienced long COVID symptoms, symptoms that lasted you know, three months in that ballpark after they had an episode of COVID. What we do see is that it seems there is an association with less incidence of long COVID in populations that had higher vaccination rates. And so that's something for us in Connecticut that I do think is in our favor. We are one of the states with the lowest incidence of long COVID. If you look at all 50 states, we have one of the lowest incidents of long COVID across the country. So that does not underestimate the fact that people who are having those symptoms are real symptoms and that what they're experiencing is real. But I do think that the fact that we have less of it is a testament to the fact that at least we know vaccination can certainly be helpful to the individual person, but also more broadly for some of these potentially longer symptoms. 
So I want to give our listeners a little bit more of our context here in Connecticut. So more data from the Census Bureau is 23% of adults in Connecticut who tested positive for COVID-19 have experienced symptoms long, lasting longer than three months, which is basically known as long COVID. And this is close to the national average of around 25%. And I just want to give our listeners also a quick reminder that you can give us a call with your questions, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Or leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. I'm going to take a quick call here from Jenny. Jenny, you are on the air. Hi, thanks very much. Of I'm course. calling today as a parent of an 18-year-old who got long COVID the second time he had COVID. And he's been out of school since mid-October but also as someone who served on a school board, and I've seen the pressure the state puts on schools to raise their attendance rate. You cannot get a top tier rating for your school if your chronic absentee rate is too high. So now the districts pressure parents and the parents are sending kids in sick. But the number of absences that kids can have was set before COVID when it was flu and colds and stomach bugs. Now we have a highly contagious virus that knocks people out for longer but we don't have any more absence slots that kids are permitted to have. So I'm just curious what you can do as a public health commissioner to work with the state to make the school attendance policies more realistic given our new disease environment. Well, thank you so much, Jenny, for uh, giving us a call. So, Commissioner, if you can respond to Jenny real quick here. Yes, thank you, Jenny. And I'm so sorry to hear about your child having to go through this at 18 years of age. That is such a struggle, and I hope that they continue to recover and recover from their symptoms. This is such a challenge that we have in our schools. And honestly, this has been an issue related to mental health, related to physical health in terms of from respiratory viral diseases. We are a continual point of resource with our State Department of Education and certainly remain a resource to them. We became that way really collaboratively through the pandemic and am more than happy to talk with them about specific issues related to what you're describing in terms of absenteeism in schools. So, you know, I think that this has been a challenge for schools to try to figure out how best to accommodate the new environment. But I also think that I'm sure schools, you know, would be open to hearing from parents and trying to figure out situations when a specific student has a more debilitating condition that has made their situation even more problematic than somebody else. And we're going to take another call coming in from Terry, who's calling from Stanford. Terry, you're on the air. Hi, I have a question about long COVID. Um, there was a Dutch study recently that um, uh, found that exercise for people who had long COVID um, resulted, could result in mitochondrial degradation and a decrease in the energy metabolism and development of microclots and organ degradation and muscle, ce uh, muscle cell degradation. And I was just wondering, um, for someone who has had COVID and who is experiencing tiredness, how does one know whether or not one has post-exertional malaise and uh, how to manage it. How do you diagnose it? Is it an all-or-nothing condition, or are there degradations? Could you uh, address that? Thank you so much, Terry, for calling in. Commissioner? This is a real challenging area for us because we learn new things from long COVID research every day and how that plays out and how the individual patient can actually translate information they read to figure out what to do themselves is a real challenge. I think a guiding principle I would offer is to really listen to your body and listen to the signals that it is giving you. If you are feeling fatigued and tired, I think rest and recuperation, there is no benefit better than sleep and restorative efforts to be able to get your body back to its baseline like anything else. There's there's really, I personally feel that that sort of holistic approach to listening to your body, there's no medication that can do that as much as what you can provide yourself. And so I think listening to your body and getting a sense of whether you're feeling really tired and fatigued, 
I would take that as a sign to continue resting a little bit longer and then try to exert yourself again and then sort of do that feedback loop of whether you can actually go further and do something more. I think being able to really get some sort of test or understand whether your body is having that type of mitochondrial stress is very difficult. There's These are really research-based things that are hard to know whether you yourself are experiencing them. But I think that's a, a practical approach to how to deal with that type of new data. And Commissioner, you've also mentioned a few times in this conversation that the burdens of COVID-19 on more uh, vulnerable demographics like the elderly and also the importance of personal choice when it comes to any types of prevention. You know, are you hearing from people who are immunocompromised about how their health, you know, their way of life, sort of like the caller just called in, you know, might have changed because of COVID-19 or due to long COVID? Absolutely. I hear from people all the time who you know, I really feel for people who have struggled with this. And one of the things that's interesting is that it does seem that some of the worst cases of long COVID do seem to have been at the be very beginning of the pandemic. That doesn't mean that people don't have very bad cases that are still happening now. That's certainly the case. But this virus has evolved. We see less of the loss of taste and smell that people were really commenting a lot about in the beginning of the pandemic. So we're seeing new and new changes every season. And yes, I, I do feel for the people who have really experienced some pretty debilitating symptoms over the course of the last several years. And for those people, as we heard with the first caller, you know, it wasn't the first episode of COVID. It was the second episode of COVID where this young person had uh, more systemic symptoms that lasted for a longer period of time. We just don't know when that's going to happen. And I think that's one of our challenges. What we do know, and I think this is one of the challenges people are also trying to figure out is, okay, I, I had COVID. Well, when should I get vaccinated? And, you know, it doesn't seem like this virus ever goes away in a given year. So, you know, in my rule of thumb there is if you had COVID, I think waiting a, at least a couple of months is probably a good idea and then getting vaccinated might help prevent getting long COVID if you were to get infected again. I would say at this point in time, I had a friend recently ask me who just got COVID this past week. And I said, I probably would wait until the fall to get vaccinated again at this point, you know, it, assuming we don't have a spring or summer surge. But this is why it's kind of ends up being top of mind for people all year round, which is challenging. People want to have to think about this in, you know, bouts of time, like we think of other respiratory viral diseases. I hope we can get there. Well, it's clearly on people's minds as well, because so before we go to a quick break, I do want to ask, you know, Donna on Facebook did post a comment asking if it's helpful for her to continue to wear a mask in public because she's immunosuppressed. And I'm also wondering if you have any final thoughts talking about um, wearing a mask or personal choice, um, especially when we were talking about earlier that the CDC may or may not drop um, certain guidances that we are familiar with. So I think one of the things I would say for an immunocompromised person is that certainly in the height of the respiratory viral disease season, as I said, October to May, I do think it's worthwhile to wear a mask in public. We're talking about COVID, flu. We touched on RSV briefly, but there are 30 some odd testable viruses in a hospital setting that we know of, human metanumovirus, parainfluenza, et cetera, et cetera. And you could get any of those. We talk about COVID, flu, and RSV because we have vaccinations, and there's something we can do about that. But we don't for many of the others. So for an immunocompromised host, I would definitely continue to recommend wearing a mask in public settings until maybe through May. You've been listening to Connecticut Department of Public Health Commissioner Manisha Jutani. Let us know if you have any public questions uh, for her. Give us a call, 888-720-9677, or leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. February is Heart Health Month. The CDC recommends all people, especially women, to take care of their cardiovascular health, not just this month, but all year long. 
Heart disease is the leading cause of death for women in the U.S. And we're going to be talking about that, plus checking in on mental health around where we live with Connecticut Department of Public Health Commissioner Manisha Jitani. And for our listeners, let us know if you have any questions for her. Join the conversation, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So Commissioner just, just mentioned that February is a heart disease prevention or heart health month. So can you talk about, you know, what does heart disease prevention look like from a public health perspective? You know, is getting the word out the number one priority, educating people? What does that look like? In public health, what you just described, getting the word out and educating people is one of the first and primary things we do. I often talk about the three E's for us at the Connecticut State Department of Public Health. And the first is to educate people. The second is for them to engage with the efforts to actually address the issue we're talking about. And third is to evolve their behavior. So if we talk about heart health, the first is to remember that prevention starts really from the time you're a young adult. It's healthy habits about exercise, watching your diet, being physically fit, being aware of things like getting your blood pressure checked, your cholesterol checked, your blood sugar checked, and knowing what your family history is. Some people are very aware of their family history. Some people don't even know what their family history might be. Right. When you have a history of heart disease in your family, as I do in mine, my father's side of the family has a lot of heart disease, you are at certain risks regardless of all the other lifestyle modifications that you can make. So one of the things we're trying to re- remind people of in the month of February as Heart Health Month is that this is a time to remember if you haven't had a primary care visit, to be able to get your blood pressure checked, to get a sense of what your cholesterol levels are, to know whether you are at risk for diabetes, this is a good time to do that and to get reengaged. The other thing that we do as a department is particularly, as you mentioned, women can often have somewhat different symptoms than men, but honestly, it's across the spectrum. Different people have different symptoms. But We do have a program called the Wise Woman Program for underinsured and uninsured women where we have particularly efforts to help with nutrition counseling, lifestyle modifications, exercise, diabetes, cholesterol, high blood pressure, all that management that we talk about that is in various different communities. So our Wise Woman Program really tries to raise the attention of this for women because we know that it can be often a silent disease for a long period of time until it's too late. Well, and and actually, recently we've had a conversation in a show uh, with two women who are living with congenital heart disease, and they wrote a book together about their experience and also the importance of treating that very unique condition. And the book is called Healing Hearts and Minds for those who are interested. So curious as to your thoughts in terms of, you know, increasing awareness in that area and sort of deepening the mental health and physical health support for people who do have congenital heart uh, diseases, because chances are pretty high that you may know one in your life. You know, congenital heart disease is something somebody is born with. And, you know, as I just mentioned with heart disease in general, the the more common types of heart disease that the general adult population is basically all at risk for at some level, at some level. Congenital heart disease is more of a specific group of people because it's you're born with it when you start and and they have specific unique challenges because often they have to go through surgery at a young age and multiple right. surgeries that go through there throughout the course of a lifetime and i think that's a very important group as well because they have their unique heart disease challenges that are different because of the surgeries that they've had to go through but the reality is for everybody for everybody the things that are in our lives stress mental health, as you talked about, these are all things that can lead to high blood pressure. These are all things that can lead to binge eating. We all know we're all vulnerable to the fact that maybe you eat too much sometimes. Maybe. Because I, I'm, I'm, I, will, I will confess. Feeling a little called out right now. <laughs> so I know I'm, I'm putting us all in the same bucket because the reality is we all are faced with these challenges. And that can put a stress on your heart, can put a stress on your mind. And the mind-body connection is ever important. We know that sleep impacts all aspects of health. So maintaining good sleep is so important. 
we know that this type of stress on your body can even ultimately lead to Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. later in life. And so all of these efforts really need to start when you're young, but it's never too late. It's never too late. As a middle-aged person, getting engaged in this type of stuff is really important. You know, I recently told a story about my father. And my father was 57 years old, and he's a cardiologist trained from India. He's a geriatrician trained in this country as well. And he had all this heart disease in his family, as I mentioned. And I used to look at him and think that he looked short of breath sometimes, think that his eyes would bug out sometimes. And this was many years ago. And I forced him to go see a doctor. He didn't want to do any of that. Uh, and he was found to have the type of lesion in his heart which people call a widowmaker lesion, which is a, a clot at the beginning of your arteries supplying the coronary arteries of your heart. At age 57, he had bypass surgery. We just celebrated his 83rd birthday. Wow. This type of prevention that can happen at any point, right? He had bl high blood pressure. He was being treated for that. He never drank. He never smoked. But he had family history. Right. And so that's not something he could do anything about. So every adult has the opportunity for prevention, whether it's getting their blood pressure in control, whether it's getting their cholesterol in control, whether it's going in for routine screening so that maybe you do need a stress test, maybe you do need a cardiac catheterization, maybe you even need surgery. But you know what? You can still have a good outcome. Well, and then speaking of a different kind of prevention, I want to pivot from heart health to mental health, as we mentioned earlier, um, especially with, amongst the youth. You know, what's the latest on efforts addressing uh, children's mental health here in Connecticut? Because we know there's been a lot of need for that support, especially the pandemic really exacerbated that situation. And just to give listeners a, a broader idea, Alex Putterman with Hearst Connecticut recently reported that roughly as many kids were stuck in 2023 as during the previous two years. And the average length of stay for behavioral health emergency room visits have declined only slightly since the deaths of the pandemic. So we, we talked a little bit about this earlier, Commissioner, that it's a Pretty shocking, but not surprising figure. So since October 2020, the data shows more than 2,000 kids on Medicaid spent at least four days in the emergency room for a behavioral health issue, and more than 230 kids spent at least two weeks there. I'm assuming none of this is a surprise uh, to you, commissioners, but what are, what are your thoughts in terms of, you know, what does that look like right now, mental health for support for the youth? So mental health challenges were certainly present before the pandemic, as you mentioned, exacerbated in the pandemic. There's new and new data coming out on other factors that continue to complicate that picture of mental health, particularly in youth, but for everybody. Loneliness, social media, there are all kinds of complicating factors that people have identified may be contributing to aspects of the mental health crisis that we've got. In the Lamont administration, there's been a very targeted focus on trying to do what we can to alleviate those stressors. There has been the establishment of urgent crisis centers, so young people and their families can go to centers that are not the emergency room to be able to get this type of health help. We in the Department of Public Health have been licensing more people, have been doing reciprocity with other states to be able to get people to provide health, uh, provide mental health services in the state. We have telehealth provisions, which allow for visits that did not occur before the pandemic. There's been new space opened up. There's been investments from our Department of Social Services into new psychiatric beds in multiple different hospitals through the state. We know that Connecticut Children's opened a new tower. So we know that there are multiple different efforts that many of us have been doing to alleviate this problem. One of the challenges is that the stressors are not necessarily going away. And so that's where it's difficult to see the advances that we have made certainly have not been enough. So that's why we continue to do more. For example, we got specific funds at the Department of Public Health to help get more social workers, psychiatrists, child psychiatrists into practices. We have different RFAs that are going out to be able to have people bring those type of providers into their practices. That's some of what we're doing right now. So 
it is a continual challenge. It is a continual problem. We're continuing to work at it so that hopefully the numbers in 24 will be better. Well, and certainly when I was in a previous life as an education reporter, the, the focus was very much on, on, on the youth in terms of mental health support, but obviously cannot negate the fact that there's also a huge need for general mental health support. So can you talk about what kind of efforts um, has been done there? Because especially recently, I mean, it's, it's, it's trending because it's an, it's an issue, but we have been seeing a lot more focus on talking about the epidemic of loneliness um, by the U.S. Surgeon General and as well as our, our own lawmakers here in Connecticut. Absolutely. And as you mentioned, the Surgeon General brought this to light. Senator Murphy has been very outspoken about this. Lieutenant Governor Beisowitz is chairing this Commission on Loneliness, which I participate in as well. And I'm grateful that there's been attention paid to this issue, which complicates our mental health challenges as well. And I think loneliness, particularly for older adults, is something that we certainly see, but we really see it across the whole life spectrum. One thing that I think has been a great advance over the last several years is 988. So 988 as a call line available by call, by text, any hour of the day or night has really been a lifeline for certain people. And this has been championed at the federal level, but is in every state. And I think that for people who are feeling suicidal, who are feeling lost in a moment, that outreach to somebody who can be there on the other end is invaluable. And I've heard multiple stories from people who often say that this was the lifeline they needed in a moment of crisis. So I think this is at least one major thing that has been done to be able to try to meet people where they are in a moment. And just a quick note for our listeners, if you are struggling, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is available online and on the phone 24 hours a day. You can go online to 988lifeline.org or dial 988, as the commissioner has just mentioned. You've been listening to the Connecticut Department of Public Health Commissioner, Manisha Jutani. You can also join the conversation. Call us with your questions at 888-720-9677 or leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. This hour, we're talking about all things public health with our Connecticut Department of Public Health Commissioner, Manisha Jutani. Let us know if you have any questions. Listeners, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So, Commissioner, doing another pivot here. Um, Last year, Connecticut passed a law aimed at addressing nurse-to-patient ratios around the state, and we spoke with Public Health Committee co-chair and State Senator Saul Anwar about how this has been going, and he said there was both good news and bad news to share. Let's take a quick listen here. The good news is that overwhelming majority are working well, at least in their report to the Department of Public Health. Uh, The not so good news is some of them actually are not following the law. So I started to get the messages in the beginning of January. Two or three of those meetings did not go well. And, and those meetings went in such a manner where the hospital person point of contact said, well, I'm not agreeing with you. I'm going to send my own report. We were the, the public health committee. I was involved in writing that bill. So I knew where that bill was and where it should be. So they said, well, no, that's not good enough. So we actually reached out to the Department of Public Health. We said, are you implementing this differently than we wrote? He said, no, we are not. He said, okay. That means that if somebody is going to not have the acknowledgement and recognition of the entire committee and make their own recommendations, that that's not going to be right. And they would actually be penalized by the Department of Public Health. So that's where it stands. So the law is the law. And if somebody is choosing not to follow it, then they will have consequences. This bill was to protect our nurses, the bedside nurses. They are the most important part of the healthcare system because they are the ones putting, giving the heart and soul and the first ones to see if something is not going right. So Senator Anwar recommended that nurses or healthcare employees with any concerns should come to the DPH or or to his office. So what's your response, Commissioner, to what uh, Senator Anwar said? As he mentioned, we're doing our part to execute what this law really intended to do. So we are working with our hospitals to make sure we get the accurate 
reports that are supposed to be submitted to us, communicating with them exactly that, and that what is identified as the appropriate report is what is sent to us. And from there, we are in the process of working through what the enforcement strategy would be for that. So because this is just going into effect, we're in the early stages of it, but we certainly are doing our part to ensure that we are getting the appropriate reports that are supposed to be sent to us. And we've also had you on the show previously to talk about PFAS and want to share that uh, Connecticut Attorney General William Tong filed two lawsuits accusing 28 chemical manufacturers of covering up for decades the dangers of PFAS or toxic forever chemicals. For those who are not familiar, uh, PFAS uh, contamination in Connecticut is well documented and widespread. We've done shows about it Um, in Connecticut alone. Thousands of sites are contaminated with PFAS, and this is according to Attorney General Tong. So can you talk about what is DPH's role and stance on this? Our role is primarily in the area of drinking water. So our Department of Energy and Environmental Protection has a large role in terms of PFAS. But ours, because drinking water safety, which ultimately is water that comes into the body and impacts health and therefore is a public health issue, is where we have certain standards that we have recommended at this point to water systems throughout the state. And so many water systems have the ability to test for PFAS and report on it. It is not a regulatory requirement at this point in time. The federal government is looking into whether such requirement will be put in place. And so we are waiting to hear what the conclusion of that is from the federal government's standpoint in terms of whether they are going to be coming forward with that. And so what we do right now is work with our water systems to be able to help them improve their systems to be able to, one, test for PFAS chemicals, and then try to remediate to be able to remove it from the water if they identify it. And we also have specific funding that was provided through the bipartisan infrastructure law passed under President Biden that gives us the ability to help water systems fund those types of projects. So we accept projects specifically to address that. And our major role is to be able to help people know how to understand this information, look it up on their own water systems website, which is often where it will be, and then be able to decide whether they are comfortable with what the water they're getting from their water system is, or if they need more information from their water system. And is that the President Joe Biden's initiative? Is that the $61 million initiative that you're talking about going into uh, drinking water, wastewater infrastructure? So that is part of it. That is part of it. But this has been really over, it was passed a few years ago now, and it's been in really has a five-year lifespan in terms of, and so we have installments sort of on a on a yearly basis. And so that is part of that in terms of what we're looking at in being able to do this type of infrastructure improvement. Can you get into more specifics on any examples of what kind of upgrades that's happening right now? So I've been to water systems where they have a carbon filtration system in place. And it's actually pretty simple. The water passes through that system and the PFAS chemicals come out. But those systems are expensive. They're they're expensive. You need to put the infrastructure in place. And so different systems are looking at whether they can purchase and put those types of systems in place within their existing infrastructure. And that's what we're here to be able to help provide technical assistance on and be able to potentially provide support through our Drinking Water State Revolving Fund to be able to help those types of projects. And also, can you talk about the DPH's uh, lead safety efforts, you know, related to this as well? You know, what's what's the department doing with ARPA funds, um, addressing sort of lead abatement activities? How is how are, how is a, a DPH addressing a removal of uh, lead service lines that serve especially disadvantaged communities? So this is a great point, and certainly an area that I feel very passionate about because lead are is exposing people and children, young children, through two different ways. One is the lead service lines, which are in the street. And part of this bipartisan infrastructure law funding that I was talking about, where we have one line item for PFAS, we have another for lead service lines, specifically for different communities to be able to get lead out from the water system. The second is a $30 million ARPA fund investment that we received as DPH to one, help local municipalities actually do case investigations when kids have been identified with toxic lead levels in the home. 
And then secondly, to do abatement in those homes to try to get the lead out of the home, because we know many young children will eat lead paint, chips of lead paint, which I understand is very sweet. So it gives them more of a desire to eat it once they start. And so we have multifaceted approaches to getting the lead out, whether it be from water systems or from homes themselves. So we have a couple of minutes uh, left here, but I don't. Want, I do want to ask them some final questions. You know, all all the all the PSAs this hour really to have you on, Commissioner. Any final recommendations for winter and and also carbon monoxide safety? You know, when we have big storms like we've had in the last couple of weeks, sometimes people lose power. People take out generators. They might put it in their garage. They might go to sleep. Maybe close the garage thinking that they're making their home warmer. And what they may not realize is that carbon monoxide is really a silent killer. It can enter your home through so many different ways. And I really want to encourage people to have carbon monoxide monitors in their home and be very careful if you lose power in terms of using generators and other mechanisms. We just want to make sure to keep the carbon monoxide out of the house. Similarly, January was radon uh, month and radon again. It's a it's a gas that's emitted from the rocks and soil. And many people have remediation systems in their home because when they purchased a home, maybe they had their home tested. I would recommend people in the winter months consider testing. And it's a cause of lung cancer, but it's very easy to remediate and prevent people from getting exposed. Well, we covered a lot of ground this hour, Commissioner. You've been listening to Connecticut Department of Public Health Commissioner Manisha Jutani. Thank you so much for spending time with us today and getting all of this PSA out there for our listeners. Always a pleasure to be here and welcome the opportunity to educate people about public health issues. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Commissioner. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Katie Pellico. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. Download where we live anytime on your favorite podcast app. And thank you so much for listening. 